this interesting topic on um, green recovery. So I have to thank everyone who has made it to this end on this platform. And I will say welcome to everybody first. Um, and then I will say that after the introduction of every participant, every speaker, we will not be respecting any protocols. So the informal protocols will only be during um, our introductions. And then we'll try to respect the time given to us. And I'll give a signal, just a quick sound. And that uh, if I do that, you know, you just have one minute to, to, to stop or to continue. So we are here today uh, to participate in, uh, in this uh, Green um, Recovery Seminar, which is part of uh, a webinar series on mainstreaming uh, natural capital in Africa post COVID-19 development agenda, uh, which is normally organized uh, jointly by, uh, by the Joint uh, Implementation Committee of the Natural Capital for African Development Finance. We call it the NC4 ADF program which is done uh, in col collaboration with the African Union Commission and then UMCCC, Regional Collaboration Center in Kampala. Um, it's a series of seminars. I think this is the third one. So we're hoping to have more. And the title of the one of today is Enhancing and Mobilizing Resources for Green and Inclusive Recovery in Africa. As we all know, African countries continue to manage the COVID-19 pandemic. And we know also that Africa has enormous resources that, required, that are required to ensure this green uh, recovery process will have the potential on the continent. Uh, that can enable us to build back a better economy that will avoid the degradation of our Africa's unique natural environmental resources. And for us to do this, we need to have a better understanding on the economic case for green recovery in Africa. We need to have a better understanding of the financial resources needed. And we need to have a better understanding of the recovery plans in Africa. Those are existing. Uh, there's some lessons we can learn from others or not. And how can these plans be financed sustainably? We need to understand better how regional institutions, financial institutions can help the process of green recovery in Africa. So today, well, we'll be talking about greening opportunities, greening and investment opportunities at the bank in Africa, some of the challenges, and we'll be hearing from a cohort of senior policy experts um, for a diversity of regional institutions, including the African Union uh, and the African Development Banks and many other important institutions in the region. So based on this, I'll be welcoming uh, 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 John Morgan for welcoming everybody officially. So please, John, please for welcome, welcoming remarks. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, I think Julius, you've done a wonderful job of welcoming everyone already today. Uh, I will so please. Yes, John, let me give a brief introduction of you. I think it's important for me to introduce you. I'm a very important person, so I cannot miss that. <laughs> um, so let me give a brief introduction with John. It's good for us to know John. Um, uh, John is not somebody that should miss us from here. So John manages the, uh, the uh, Green Growth Knowledge uh, Partnership Program, uh, which is a neutral intercontinental research and in-country science policy uh, it deals with uh, uh, intercontinental research and in-country science policy applications. He serves as the focal point for the GGKP. This is the Green Growth uh, Knowledge Platform in, in terms of operations and collaborative. Uh, he has his expertise on all this. Um, and with this his expertise, expertise, he has been able to coordinate six of such groups uh, around the world uh, on major teams such as uh, Natural Capital, which is this one is one of them trade com and competitive competitiveness, uh, green growth and sustainable infrastructure. And today we'll be talking about green, uh, green infrastructure, investment in green infrastructure. So uh, John is actually an asset for us uh, and he'll be, into, be welcoming all of us uh, to, to, to these discussions. Thank you very much. John, over to you, thank you. Thank you so much, Julius. Yes, I've, I've been very fortunate uh, to be a part of this program, the NC4 ADF program. And I see our colleagues are dropping helpful links for those of you who aren't familiar with the program into the chat. 
we set out to create this program back in 2019. Um, in particular, it derived out of this natural capital expert group that, that Julius mentioned. Uh, and we had some eminent um, uh, members of that group from uh, the AFDB. And so we started up a series of chats back in 2019. How do we you know, bring the natural capital agenda to um, arguably one of the world's most important places to bring it to, uh, into Africa? And we had no idea what was coming, how much things would radically change. And only a few months after we sealed the envelope on, on putting together this program, the economies of the world shut down almost overnight, uh, all of us remember. And we saw in Africa in particular, a serious contraction over the year 2020 in economic activity. Of course, it happened everywhere. Um, but uh, on the continent was not felt any less, um, contractions in exports. Um, and uh, we saw economic activity, particularly in smaller economies, um, greatly reduce, um, first recession in decades. And yet the problem that we set out to solve with the NC4ADF program also remained. So how do we uh, continue to um, build on Africa's wealth in a sustainable way, natural wealth in particular? And since then, we've seen this problem continue. We've, you know, uh, in terms of um, worldwide biodiversity loss, we have the IPBES reports. Um, IPBES came out and said that uh, by 2021, sorry, 2100, 2100, um, we could see a huge decline in plant and animal species in Africa, and which of us wouldn't be not only sad, but devastated to see that happen. Um, and that's coming from current trends in climate change and land use. And so how we've got the, we wound up with this new short-term problem, hopefully short-term around economic recovery from COVID-19, uh, but then still this longer term problem, this longer term trend of how do we ensure the sustainability of this natural wealth. Today, we're not just talking about recovery, we're talking about a green recovery, and one in which uh, we not only help our peoples, our peoples and the peoples of Africa recover from the economic crisis of COVID-19, but also the long-term crisis of biodiversity loss. Um, and in Africa, that recovery really took on a new dimension. On the economic side, I think today will be hearing from the real experts, I'm not one of them, but those around this table are, um, talking about debt um, and how to secure um, the adequate resources and also manage um, to secure those resources over time uh, in Africa to provide the stimulus um, and stimulus in the right way that we can secure this green recovery. And on the environmental side, uh, we'll be talking about how Africa, the wonder of the world for its gorgeous landscapes, its megafauna, its natural resources, how can we ensure that that natural wealth um, helps the continent and itself uh, prosper long into the future? We saw from the WWF report, this great report in 2020, uh, Africa in the context of COVID-19, that Africa has 25% of the world's biodiversity, 50% of its remaining arable land, 30% of the world's mineral resources, Obviously, this, Africa cannot be left behind. This is a top priority, and I'm glad we're talking about it today. Uh, Africa is really special in so many ways, and we're really fortunate to have with us the institutions that we have today, um, the African Union, uh, who's co-organizing this uh, important webinar series, the African Development Bank, uh, core partner, the NC4ADF program, and these wonderful partners, ECOWAS, uh, DBSA, uh, uh, from the region and a range of friends and dedicated partners, including the UN and WWF. Uh, they'll be helping us together with you, our audience, discuss solutions today to how we can continue to ensure Africa's, Africa's prosperity uh, in all ways long into the future. So welcome from me uh, and looking forward to today's conversation. Back to you, Julius. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much, uh, John, for giving us uh, setting the scene for our webinar. And um, um, I think you've said it all with respect to the endowment in Africa, with respect to natural resources. 
um, and the, the, the potential challenges with respect to their management and, and to ensure the sustainability of the resources for the betterment of African economy. So, um, that said, I want to thank you very much again, and then um, I will move on to uh, introduce our imminent guest speaker um, for this uh, webinar. I, who is no other but um, our famous uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Mahuba. Mahuba Dian. Dr. Hi. Mahuba Dian, Dian is the Vice President in charge of Finance and Corporate Services at the ECOWAS Bank for Investment and Development, EBIT. He is a seasoned international investment and development banker with more than 20 years of various executive responsibility in different parts of Africa. He holds a PhD in financial management and portfolio optimization. So, Jan, you will be talking to us, uh, just um, giving us a synopsis of your experiences on tapping existing funding mechanisms and pipelines for green cover in Africa. That will be your major area of talk today. Um, so uh, we'll be giving you not much time, very economy work. Our greater resource today is time. Um, so we're giving you only 10 minutes. Uh, and if you could even use less than that, it would be great for the discussion to go forward. Um, so we'll be coming back to you. Thank you very much. Uh, many yeah. thanks. Many, yeah. many thanks, Dr. Julius, yeah. and uh, thanks to John, and uh, to, to also start thanking the organizer of this uh, very important webinar. And on behalf of our president, Dr. George Donkor, which is the president and chairman of the ECOWAS Investment Development Bank, and on behalf of all our colleagues, we thank you a lot. And uh, John, please allow me to, to, to also crystallize some of the points that you mentioned. From time to time, I will swap my head from being a young African to being politically correct the vice president. And uh, today, post-COVID, I believe that the world and the African should stop talking about opportunities in Africa and just getting things done. And uh, I honestly believe that mobilizing capital to boost the industrialization and the recovery and the green recovery of Africa is not the major challenge. Today, Africa has a unique opportunity to rise financing, to attract financing because of the attractiveness of the opportunities that is on the ground. And please allow me to elaborate a little bit on that. Post COVID, 90% of the European Western developed countries are willing and are looking for export markets market. in terms of machinery. But at the same time, their governments are willing and strongly committed to avail export credit agency financing, usually known in our jargon as ECA financing. And this could be an amazing opportunity for the African countries to attract capital to modernize their agri-industry, including agro-processing, to modernize their transport and logistic capabilities. Today, Africa import more than $35 billion of food. And like John Riley said, it, we have Arab land, we have water. If now, post COVID, there is an opportunity to tap into those ECA financing, by leveraging and boosting economic, economic diplomacy, there is an amazing opportunity for the African country, countries to attract capital. I see post COVID more and more regional African DFI collaborating between themselves. Africa Exim Bank helping ECOWAS Investment and Development Bank, Africa Finance Corporation in, uh, helping uh, 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 the ECOWAS Investment and Development Bank. Badea Bank helping Africa uh, uh, across investment and development bank by giving them, uh, 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 let's say, DFI, uh, bilateral lines. We see also development financing institutions like us extending credit line to local commercial banks 
to boost the SME financing. Although it has been happening before COVID, but now things are getting in an accelerator in, in a fast track mode. I just come from a, 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 an economic mission from, the, in, from Vietnam, where African countries like Ivory Coast producing one, more than 1 million, million metric tons of cashew, but where, but, but exporting more than 90% of the production in row, we just have a case study showing that by just spending $1 billion, the entire uh, uh, Ivorian, uh, uh, Ivory Coast uh, uh, cashew nut production could be produced locally and doubling the revenue amount for the country. Today, one kilogram of raw cashew costs 400 CFA. The 1 million metric tons generate today more, not more than 400 billion CFA to the country. Processed, it can easily generate 1.5 billion. And attracting this capital to build those factories, the opportunity is there. Developed countries are dying to export their machinery. I think that it's an amazing opportunity for Africa to size that moment. Energy, clean energy and renewable energy. The world has committed to move away from more pollution driven energy toward renewable and more clean energy. Moment has never been great than today post COVID for African countries to rise on a, a cleaner and renewable energy driven financing. And I strongly believe that it's doable. More and more also we see local governments, rising local government, lo lo local currency bond and the tremendous success that Benin did recently by issuing a first ever 15 and 20 year money on the off in the local market 2.3 times oversubscribed is a pertinent evidence that it's possible and the appetite is there. We recently signed also a co-industrialization development program with BPI France, supported by some time by the Agence Française de Développement, to show you that at a global level, uh, 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 DFI are working together in order to improve the access of capital for, the, for boosting the industrialization of Africa. And these are examples uh, that really shows that uh, how uh, uh, the green recovery of Africa could be achieved, could be delivered, could be financed, leveraging the international corporations. Last but not but least, we recently also attract $150 million from the Arab Africa Trade Bridge Program, where the ECOWAS Investment and Development Bank, working hand in hand with uh, Islamic Development Bank through their trade finance arm, which is ITFC, alongside their insurance credit arm, which is ISIC, working together with Badea Bank, working together with regional DFR, regional uh, commercial banks like BOA, we did put together $150 million to boost the access of fertilizer into the ECOWAS region. And uh, these are relatively good examples showing how the green recovery of Africa could be done. And, uh, and, and I, again, I, I wish to finish my, my intervention there and, uh, and thanking uh, the organization of this webinar for this tremendous, uh, for this well, for this very important uh, webinar. Thank you, Julius, and thank you, John. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much, Dian. This is very, very interesting. Uh, this, um, you've just given a snapshot of the, the problems uh, of uh, Africa. Um, it's like we are afraid of really mobilizing uh, um, uh, financial resources to ensure that we industrialize our different commodity value chains. Um, I think you've really highlighted a good example, the case of the cash flow notes. Uh, that is actually, if Cote d'Ivoire could actually process more, the 90% of its cash flow note that is exporting instead of processing in Cote d'Ivoire, they should have been earning more money from cash flow notes than from the oil sector. Uh, I, I, I think we did comparison with one, and I, I, actually that's the case. 
So African countries have uh, to the continent, and they have to be bold uh, in this direction. I think uh, your message is very clear. Thank you very much. We'll be coming back to you for, for clarification on certain issues later. With that said, we'll be inviting uh, our keynote speaker for today. I, I wonder if she's already, um, she has already joined. It's like we were having difficulty joining us. I'm not seeing her yet. She's here. She's here. Oh, right. Great, great. And, uh, Madam Lia Nice Wanambwa. That is the name. Very, very nice name and very unique. Um, so, Madam Boa is the next person who is going to give us a keynote speech today. Um, she is a senior policy officer in the, in the Director of Sustainable Environment and Green Economy at the African Union Commission headquarters in Addis Ababa. She is specifically working on climate change, change, and conservation of Africa's wildlife, wildlife fauna and flora, as wildlife, and biodiversity portfolios. She has over 15 years experience working on environmental policy, advocacy, and communications. And prior to joining the African Union Commission, she worked with UNEP in Nairobi and also with the Green Bear Movement, which is an NGO in Kenya. In, in Kenya. So with this said, um, Madania, you will be talk, telling us today a little bit uh, on, on meeting the research, research challenges of the complementary and divergent green recovery plans. Um, that is Green Recovery Plan Action and Green Stimulus Program of the African Union and other their countries cases that you will share with us. You just have to give us a synopsis of that for us to stimulate the discussion for today. Uh, with that said, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you, moderator. And uh, apologies, I will have to keep my camera off because uh, of the bandwidth that we are having here. Um, so yes, my name is Leah, and I'm working mainly on the, the Green Recovery Action Plan, but also climate change and issues of biodiversity and wildlife. Uh, I will be very brief, but on the Green Recovery Action Plan, of course, this was launched and uh, in January, it was adopted by the AU Assembly of Heads of State and Government. And um, of course, the next plan is now the operationalization. What are the resource challenges? Resource challenges, we are looking at resources for implementation at the country level, uh, coordination at the continental level. So there's multiple levels of uh, resource needs. We have not just the financial requirements, uh, for example, to run the secretariat and also for countries to be able to implement this, but we also have technical sub needs, which are, of course, working with different partners, we are slowly trying to build that up. Um, Technical support, of course, could come in different forms, can come from, in our case, we are working with the NDC partnership who have seconded staff to our office and they, I'm sure they are supported, they are also seconded staff to different uh, countries to, through the economic advisors. But again, uh, that is just one organization. There are many others in the pipeline that we are working on with. And it's not just, like I mentioned, the, the financial needs, but also the, the technical, which is sometimes overlooked. Uh, then we have also the kind of support where the, the, the stakeholder or the partner may not have neither the technical nor financial, but they do have the means to advocate for some of the work and popularize it among the, the different um, stakeholders out there. So of course the communication and advocacy is also another kind of uh, resource, if you can call it for now that how do we synergize or make better use of the little uh, resources that we have uh, trying to align the different policies and uh, frameworks which you already have for example you mentioned the green stimulus program uh, it would be counterproductive to send the same uh, document and the green recovery one out to the countries to implement at different levels so identifying areas where the two are converging uh, be it in the area of natural resource management and the biodiversity, um, is it on the renewable energy? So having joint initiatives uh, will support, uh, will minimize the, the need to have a 
bigger resource uh, needs because also the, the partners get tired you're coming within one initiative and changing again um the other way is also to harmonize uh, the activities which will help in the countries when they are doing the reporting if you're going to track uh, if you're going to track the implementation countries have to report back and it will be difficult for them to report to different platforms so it's usually better if the the indicators are harmonized and uh, so for easy reporting and tracking uh, by countries um, the other one is coordination, of course. Uh, it, uh, it will be important to have one coordinate or coordination point. Uh, otherwise, we have different initiatives taking countries left and right, uh, trying to implement the same thing uh, almost, but a little bit different, again, because of the different titles. But eventually, and at the end of the day, it's all about greening, it's about recovery, it's all about uh, sustainable development. So of course, they need to harmonize across the different frameworks and policies that we have. Um, again, to reduce the burden on the countries who are pulled left to right and across different initiatives and frameworks that exist up there. Uh, so with that, uh, the moderator will stop and maybe sit and wait for the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Yeah, I think you've saved a lot of time uh, with your talk and uh, we'll, we'll be coming back to you for more interactive uh, uh, during the interactive technical panel discussions, um, we will be coming back to you to ask uh, more specific questions, especially related in relation to civil society engagement and the like. So we'll be coming back to you later. Thank you very much. So for now, I will be introducing, uh, you've talked about the, the different country level implementations of um, the, the Green Recovery Plan that was adopted in January, which is very good. Um, there are time pipelines of financial and technical needs, um, not just financial, but time and technical needs are very important. They will need to think about stakeholder engagement, engagement and how to maximize uh, available resources. And to maximize uh, available resources, you talk about converging areas, joint initiatives, harmonizing activities within countries, and uh, for reporting and tracking and coordination of, uh, for, of recovery efforts. So with that said, uh, we move into the technical panel discussion. Um, for that, we have four people, four experts, uh, senior experts, not just any type of experts. Uh, four senior experts, uh, yeah, that will be we'll be introducing them now. Uh, the first one is um, uh, Katarine Kaufman. Uh, as I said, I, 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 I remove all protocol, all protocol duly observed, but at the same time, we, 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 we remove all protocols here. So I'm not giving titles, I'm not calling any more doctor, I just gave it to uh, Dr. Jen, he was the only person I said doctor, doctor, but uh, this time we're not giving any titles to anybody. So we are just saying Catherine Kaufman, uh, who is an executive, uh, is a group executive uh, director, uh, project preparation and climate finance at the Volume Bank of Southern Africa. Uh, Katarina has um, is a qualified and admitted attorney with more than 20 years uh, experience in legal, commercial, and financial services. She, uh, she is recognized for extensive infrastructure investment banking expertise across numerous sectors and has been intimately, intimately involved in several firsts. Uh, landmark infrastructure project finance transactions. Um, so far, Katrina has worked with several institutions, uh, financial institutions at the level of advisory services, had to auto Addison, which is popularly known, with a net bank, yeah, net bank in South Africa, I think, um, on the net bank capital infrastructure and telecoms uh, project finance team. Uh, she was the first female head of infrastructure project finance in a commercial bank in South Africa. Um, we have mandate including determining and executing the group's uh, infrastructure growth strategy for South Africa and the rest of Africa. So that is our first panelist. Uh, then the second panelist we're going to have is nobody but us, but uh, uh, I would say Elvis Paul Tagen, um, who is uh, the coordinator for the Great Green Wall Initiative of the African Union Commission. Um, 
service is a specialist with a doctorate degree in and a master degree in eco forest ecology in ecology i don't know whether it's, it should be both forest and agriculture ecology maybe um and then he is a social development worker he works on biodiversity conservation climate change and value change development uh, for over 20 years in united kingdom in africa in asia so he has a vast continental experience um and then he has worked with many international organizations including fao uh, the 38 international uh, watershed task group and many others uh, in several projects uh, in, in terms of project management and coordination is very good in development of uh, forest product value chains is very good in those things sustainable development and conservation climate change sustainable land management restoration and many others so um, every place you are welcome to the uh, technical session um, and then we're going to be having every will be there will be answering to patients related to uh, green recovery and the role of great green wall um, for the mobilization for resource mobilization and resilience building i i didn't say something about um, about uh, she is going actually to be talking to us uh, the economic case for green recovery in Africa. And you know, we all have experience in the banking sector, in the development finance investment. I think there's no better person than that. I think we're going to learn a lot. So, uh, apart from Elvis, we're having uh, Marco Alud, um, is, who is uh, an associate global coordinator for the Biodiversity Finance Initiative, the Koi Biofin in the UNDP. And uh, Marco, as a member of the Biofin Global Management and Technical Team, Marco is working on the program management and supporting the development of the Biofin methodology. Um, earlier, he worked in the banking sector in the research uh, department, uh, focusing on risk diversification, diversification in a portfolio. Marco has several master degrees on finance, quantitative economics, environmental, energy, and social development economics. Um, last but not the least, we are going to be talking with uh, uh, the next panelist will be uh, uh, Ms. Uh, Titilope Gozi Akosa. Um, she is the executive director, Center for the 21st Century um, Issues. They call it C21ST. Uh, Titilope, but I mean, Bartiti, I think that is the, 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 the how do they call that? Um, that of a short, short form, the name is the Global South um, Alternative Active uh, Civil Society Observer to the Green Climate Fund. This is where the money is. I mean, green recovery we must go to Green Climate Fund. So we'll be learning a lot from from, from, from um, Gozi. I prefer Gozi because it's easier. It comes very fast into my head. I used to have a very good classmate called Gozi. So when I saw, I, I tried to see the picture where I, she was the one with not else. Yeah. So she is the executive director for the Center of 21st Century Issues, and she serves as a uh, global climate fund gender monitor for Anglophone Africa. So Gozi will be talking to, will be talking to us on ensuring impact of the finance for green, green recovery, the role of civil society organizations, organizations and local communities. So that said, we need to start uh, talking about some of the main issues. Uh, the main issues that we've already heard about today is, um, is actually on uh, green opportunities and on biodiversity finance, on green infrastructure investments, on green recovery and green uh, green economy plans, and then we have to be talking about green energy transition, uh, which um, Dr. Dia and already mentioned, uh, with respect to clean energy and a private sector engagement, uh, allocation of funds to civil society organizations, uh, that is governance of funds to civil society organizations. We'll be dealing with things like that, uh, and, and many more other things that we'll be, we'll be talking about today, uh, including things related to green economy and green government. So that said, we'll be asking the first question to uh, to Catherine. Um, and the first question we're asking for us to give us 
uh, is what is the role of regional development finance institutions in support of existing green inclusive recovery and growth in post COVID-19 Africa. We'll be talking about giving us a brief resume on that and what support is your institutions providing uh, and how, in what direction do you think this can be sustainable? Um, uh, what can your peers learn from you? What can we learn from you uh, today in terms of embedding nature in its infrastructure, fi infrastructure finance, especially around the context of recovery from the pandemic? So over to you, um, Catherine, uh, please go ahead to give us uh, your insights. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. And I assume that, as you mentioned, protocol is being observed. So I'll just attend to the questions that you asked, um, which are quite a few. So I'll try to be brief. I think that um, our initial speaker, our very first, I think John mentioned the impact of the pandemic on the continent, um, not only the continent, of course, across the globe. But uh, I think for Africa, our economies, it exposed us uh, significantly on how vulnerable we are. Um, uh, immediately following or at the start of the pandemic, you saw our economy is going to recession immediately and our currency is being, our country ratings being downgraded. Our currency is being devalued more. Um, so we spend a, a significant amount of capital um, allocated to fighting the, the, the disease, fighting the virus. Um, my, I must admit that, like with most adversity, we saw uh, opportunity in this because what it presented to us was to relook really at how we addre address socioeconomic development on the continent. Um, it almost forced us to reimagine um, and rebuild uh, our, our economies in, in a different way and revive African economies, not only for growth, but beyond pre-pandemic levels of growth into more inclusivity and sustainable economies that are, that are climate resilient. Uh, it enabled us now to look at how we can develop socioeconomic frameworks that is underpinned by green financing frameworks. From a, from a development finance perspective. I think the opportunity there is, we still have a backlog of infrastructure. We've always, that has always been a concern for us. And um, what the pandemic has done is that it, it allowed us to address this backlog of infrastructure on the continent in a way um, that, that focuses allocation of capital to address climate risk mitigation. And more importantly, as regional DFIs and the type of role that we play, it allowed us to now introduce green technologies that would leapfrog our infrastructure backlogs, you know, into different sectors, whether it's water or transport or, or health uh, and other areas of biodiversity. It really helped us to hedge ourselves against future stranded assets. So um, development finance institutions, as you're aware, we, we play quite an important role to step into the gaps or the risk areas when commercial and private investors are, are unable to do so for many reasons. Commercial banks, they've got Basel III, they've got very different risk frameworks from development um, financial institutions. So this is providing us with an opportunity to feel a recovery a green recovery for Africa that includes the characteristics that we come with, which is credit enhancement, long tenors, first loss or quasi equity positions, credit guarantees. And it also allowed us to ensure that we make green projects more affordable because as, as development institutions, we can actually access a capital uh, or green finance, um, green finance funding to invest in these projects and rebuild our economies. Uh, in South Africa in particular, if I may just give you an example, is I'm sure everyone's aware of the infrastructure fund that's been incubated at the Development Bank of South Africa on behalf of the government. And it's supposed to be an accelerator platform 
for infrastructure delivery in the country. The, the infrastructure fund has quite a substantial pipeline of projects um, to deliver to the market. The area where I reside, which is the project preparation division within the DBSA prepare the pipeline for the infrastructure fund. And um, in that pipeline, we are inculcating climate finance or climate risk mitigation tools to make sure that the, the projects, the infrastructure that we deliver to our citizens actually take into account a new greener economy, which means we have to develop green, green jobs. And it's, it, it's quite a coordinated view that you have to take as a country to, um, to, to truly move towards a, a, a green economy. So in, in relation to your question, I think you asked another question um, about um, what our roles are and what we have done or what other, other folks can learn from us. I think, first of all, we need to understand that we are also learning all the time. So we're learning from our peers, we're learning from other development finance institutions. We belong to the International Development Finance um, Institution uh, Club which allows us to exchange ideas, to exchange um, IP around best practice, around frameworks, developing different frameworks within this green um, uh, infrastructure framework. Um, so it's really about collaborating with each other uh, and, and, and understanding your own context, where you operating from. Uh, what is suitable and appropriate for the policies that your government's implementing and how to introduce those, those um, green finance solutions uh, to implement those policies. The, the, the DBSA itself started some time ago on this journey of um, mainstreaming climate finance into their socioeconomic development goals. Um, they were accredited in 2012 with the Green Environmental Fund, the GIF. Um, uh, sorry, the, the, the Green Fund in South Africa, uh, which is South African Climate Fund. And, and then later on in 2015 with the, with the GIF. And then again with the largest international uh, Green Climate Fund, which is the um, um, GCF. Uh, in fact, our reaccreditation is being considered today, so I'm hoping that's a positive result. But that has been instrumental. So partnering with institutions that uh, allows that, that that allows you access to green finance is, is very important. And understanding uh, and, and inculcating that as part of your DNA as a development bank that is becoming quite important. It is not easy. Um, because in, in the move towards a greener economy, there, there obviously has to be a move away from carbon intensive industries. And carbon intensive industries, if you just apply that logic uh, bluntly, would lead to, in many instances, economic suicide for African economies. Um, so it's really about ensuring that as we recover the economy after COVID, we do so in a just way in a way that we take care of people along the way that may be impacted by uh, jobs being, being lost in carbon intensive industries. How do we reskill people? Um, we're also involved as a development bank in um, thought leadership or discussions around, for instance, fiscal reform, green fiscal reform, like creating a new taxonomy. We work with national treasury to create uh, a new a taxonomy around um, green finance. So there's no greenwashing as we implement our just transition strategy. Uh, so that we all understand, we all have the same understanding of what it means to be green, you know, and the language is the same. Uh, there are also other ways we've got a carbon tax policy, which I'm sure many countries already have. Um, but also how do you motivate and incentivize investors um, not only private investors, because private investors are actually quite motivated. Um, their shareholders are quite motivated and their stakeholders are quite motivated. But at, at a government level, motivating and incentivizing your public sector stakeholders to move a certain way in terms of how they procure um, 
um, uh, infrastructure? What does the procurement documentation look like? Does it incentivize people to introduce climate risk mitigation into the solution that they are presenting? Um, uh, other ways, um, I know that some countries have started uh, reducing fossil fuel subsidies. Um, again, even when you do that, you need to be careful. Coordination is extremely important because you need to ensure that you have an alternative ways of powering uh, motor vehicles. Do you have a robust uh, electric motor vehicle industry? You know, is the, is the infrastructure there? Um, so it has to be done in a coordinated approach. And, and so I, I can't necessarily say that there's much to learn from us. I think we have ideas to exchange with, with the rest of uh, the, the community, the African community and, and other, uh, organs of state, but that is also because we also want to learn in terms of what you're doing in your regions, in your jurisdictions, and not only on the continent, obviously abroad, but I also like to um, send a word of caution to our partners abroad that whatever we introduce in, on the continent has to be appropriate for the continent, it has to be in our context. And so we appreciate the partnership and exchange of ideas, but there needs to be a, a degree of grace and patience as we walk this journey towards a just transition. I don't know if, I, if I've run out of time. If, if thank, I you, thank, time, you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you very much. I, it was, uh, you've said it all, you've actually told us that there is need to uh, be recovery in Africa, that the pandemic has made us uh, to learned on some lessons and to reimagine our economies beyond pre-pandemic levels and the role of the DFIS you've actually finished and uh, elaborated on that giving the example of South Africa and the need to mainstream uh, climate change uh, mitigation tools um, into all projects uh, to create green jobs and um, which is very very uh, laudable um, that you've also accepted that you are also learning, it's a learning process, um, uh, green finance and everything is a learning process and the exchanges are important. And that uh, whatever intervention we are thinking about, especially from our partners abroad, we need to contextualize uh, everything we're doing uh, within the, that of uh, the African environment. Thank you very much for that. And we'll be doing some follow-up later with you. Um, um, I think there are some people who always put their questions in chat boxes. Uh, more questions are coming in and most likely we'll have to go. There's a very hot question that has to go back to Dr. Diane, uh, which is asking something on agro-processing industries, industrial zones. Uh, development by the EBDI, that is the ECOWAS Bank for Investment and Development. So the question is, when this kind of infrastructure, infrastructure learning projects is implemented in ECOWAS, how does EBID make sure to manage the balance between impact of the projects on nature and benefits to communities? Um, I'm sorry, Dr. Jay, I'm coming back to you. Uh, it is just because it's also linked to investment that um, um, Catherine is talking about. So we want to trash the topic of investment before we start thinking about the opportunity, greening opportunities. Um, so Dr. Diane, please just give us a, a, a very snapshot, a uh, very short answer to this uh, winning question. Thank you very much. Dr. Diane? Let me, uh, okay. uh, many thanks, Julius. Let, yes. me, let me tell you how we did start it and how we did execute end to end while making sure that the green boxes are ticked. We have started to work together with the country. Ivory Coast produced 1 million metric tons. Today, it the road costs 400,000 400, CFR. The entire production on a row basis is 400 billion CFR, which is less than $700 million. And now we have asked ourselves together with the government, together with the private sector, together with even the, the, the importers, right? Which are mainly India and Vietnam. We sit down together and say, guys, if we would have to export this entire production, what is the total value? 
four gram of raw cashew produce one uh, uh, clean exportable uh, uh, kilogram. The kilogram of expo clean export process exportable could six dollar. One million divided four, one million metric tons divided by four, two hundred fifty thousand metric tons multiplied by six thousand dollar. It's one point five billion. Yeah. Now we ask ourselves, how much would it cost to process the entire production? Seventy-eight factories of fifty thousand metric tons a day, two hundred fifty-five days in a year. The entire production is processed. All right. Moving from seven hundred fifty million to one point five billion, we don't need we don't need to do a lot of mathematics in order to be able to know that. When we do it, less than five years, the entire debt is fully paid. Now, please now allow me to be non non diplomatic. African people should stop crying and just get it done. DBSA is doing a fantastic job supporting African countries across the continent. African Development Bank, Afri Exim Bank, IFC, ECOWAS Investment and Development Bank, Badea Bank, across all international partners, African people just must stop doing the nonsense and get the things done. Now, what do we do in order to make sure that the green boxes are ticked? We do a proper EIS. When we build a factory somewhere, we don't move people or we, we, we mitigate moving the maximum number of people. We make sure that clean energy or cleaner energy or ideally, ideally renew, renewable energy is used. When in the factories, we make sure that youth, woman, job creation is ticked. During the trust, you know, during the, let's say during the trading, because there is a lot of trading happening in order to collect those national production. We make sure that the small scale farmer, the vulnerable farmer, is looked after into the process by defining at a policy level, at a national uh, uh, level, the minimum, absolute minimum uh, 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 price for the purchase. And all those things are also, uh, let's say, making sure that, you know, uh, things are done in a very inclusive manner, in a very sustainable manner, and in a very fair manner. Now, uh, because the international buyer play a very important role in the global distribution, we get them involved locally by setting companies where they are JV, the state is a shareholder, the government is a head shareholder, the, the private sector is a shareholder, and, and the international buyers are a shareholder. This is basically how we have done it. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. This is very, very clear, clear. I think yeah, all of us, I mean, uh, the, the arithmetic is simple and we we'll get to get things done, we'll get to get things done, and there are ways to tick the boxes. I think you've explained everything. I think there is no, no question we'll come back to this uh, to you on this. Thank you very much. Thank you. So um, moving forward, uh, we will move away a little bit away, away from investments, uh, infrastructure investment, green investments. Um, we're moving on now to how to, to green the environment, greening, taking the example for the great green war and getting the like, lessons from there. So uh, this is nobody but uh, Evis. I'll be talking to us on this. And Evis, please uh, talk about talk to us on uh, support of the green economy. What supporting rules does the green uh, great war provide on the African continent? Uh, how can this great green war provide a landing pad for resource mobilization, realizing ruralizing green recovery and building resilience in Africa? Um, Dr. Davis, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, uh, my brother Julius and Eugene and all those who are present um, here. <coughs> Sorry. I'm going around a bit, so the network might be up and down. <coughs> so, yes, uh, yes, I'll be talking about uh, a good green wall and the role of the good green wall in the uh, um, uh, resource mobilization to enhance uh, resilience and uh, ecosystems on the, on the continent. Uh, so, um, uh, so as a way of introducing uh, um, uh, my ideas, I will talk about the importance of the importance of of the outbreak of the. COVID pandemic on the, 
on the continent, uh, the impacts that it had on the on 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 the 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 resilience, the economic impact, the socioeconomic, and uh, of course environmental impact. And by so doing, I will also to talk a bit about uh, definitions and various nexuses that exist: resilience, uh, vulnerabilities, adaptation. And of course, I'll go now down to the Great Green World. So, uh, Julius, before I, I go on, we, we, we knew about uh, all what happened because of the outbreak of the pandemic in 2020. We knew we know how bad it affected the economies of our member states, and uh, especially how it affected very disproportionately um, some people and uh, some of our communities that were already um, uh, somehow uh, um, uh, vulnerable, especially we talk about small older farmers, those who were dependent, uh, those in the informal sectors, it affected them disproportionately compared to some of us that we can say uh, are city dwellers or maybe a bit of uh, middle, uh, middle class. And so it's, it's very important for us to look at the whole idea of, of, uh, of vulnerabilities, which is uh, more about uh, the inability to, uh, to withstand shocks, the inability to come back from shocks, and, uh, and the resilience, which is also almost like, though not exclusively the, the opposite of vulnerabilities, which is about the ability uh, to come back or to withstand and come back from shocks. And uh, we look at the issues of adaptation, which is also the ability to um, uh, to continue existence and uh, adapting to um, uh, uh, climatic changes and variability. And, and so when we look at uh, this aspect, we know that uh, within the framework of uh, the continent within the framework of the Africa Union, uh, there are a lot of uh, there are a lot of projects, programs, strategies, and policies that have been put in place to to support our member states to be able to um, uh, to bounce back in time of adversity. Um, uh, and uh, you know, I have to 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 say. When we're talking about adversity, we need to look at the, the current uh, uh, Russo Ukrainian conflict, the conflict between Russia and Ukraine, and the, already the impact and the potential that impact that is going to have on, on, uh, on uh, food systems and, uh, of course, energy uh, and uh, basic necessities like this. As you know, Ukraine and uh, Russia are some of uh, the biggest. Um, uh, producers of taco meal for our country, we're talking wheat and maize and even uh, petroleum products and things like that. So the fact that they are into this conflict and their inability to produce is uh, it's a huge uh, issue for the continent. The small gains that our member states have been making from uh, bouncing back from COVID, a bit. Uh, is being compromised by what is now happening in uh, in that uh, the Balkan regions. So uh, we are back again, almost to the vulnerabilities that we had at the heart of COVID. Um, uh, so, um, uh, as I said, our uh, talking about vulnerabilities in general, our member states have put in place the African have put in place various supporting structures, various uh, policies. And our level, we have the uh, several policies that have been put in place uh, as far as uh, uh, these are concerned. If you look at our program, we have um, we have the yeah. Oh, thank you. Uh, we have uh, the. Uh, various program we have uh, at the level of the continent. Uh, we are in the Department of uh, Sustainable, the Directorate of Sustainable Environment and Blue Economy, which is under the Department of Agriculture, Rural Development, 
blue economy and, and a sustainable environment. And we have various uh, um, uh, programs like climate change for desertification, forest, wildlife, for and fauna, sustainable environment, land restoration. And uh, we have um, uh, recently the new blue economy uh, division, which is all about looking at issues to do with uh, blue economy, uh, marine uh, uh, conservation. And then uh, on that, we also have various programs like uh, the disaster reproduction, the Great Green World Cream Sad, and now we have uh, the Green Recovery Action Plan. And uh, going into the Great Green World, which is what uh, really concerns uh, me, um, the Great Green World was created uh, by our member state, by the head of state uh, in 2005, 2007. And uh, it's all about uh, building resilience in Africa's drylands. As you know, um, uh, drylands uh, make up about 60% uh, of the continent. And these are areas uh, of, uh, of unique ecosystems. Um, they are generally vulnerable to extreme uh, climatic uh, um, uh, uh, climatic uh, changes, and uh, we have um, uh, challenges like uh, extreme um, uh, rain, which causes floods, extreme uh, dryness, which leads to drought, and uh, between these, you have. Um, the impacts that include uh, the drop in the hills of land, you have uh, erosion, you have uh, insect pests, you have all type of uh, challenges that this region faces. So this led to the creation of the Great Green World with the main aim of uh, uh, supporting uh, our member states that are found in this um, region. Um, uh, especially those in the Sahara Sahel uh, region, um, uh, to build their resilience to to climate change and all these um, um, uh, extreme weather conditions. Um, the program has been going on uh, for a decade and a half, and in 2015 uh, we started also the extension of this um, uh, of the program to the um, uh, to the Southern Africa region, I mean, uh, properly the Sadek uh, region. Uh, most of what is done in the program, apart from uh, um, uh, enhancing, harmonize, uh, cross boundary and regional and sub regional strategy to combat desertification, we are then take all, all the activities that cause under sustainable land management and restoration. As you imagine, this means a bit of everything. It's, it's about uh, restoration of, of, of lands, it's about provision of portable water, enhancing climate, smart agriculture, working on, uh, on the pastoralist communities, uh, pastoralists and um, uh, supporting pastoralist systems, um, uh, agro-sigo pastoral system in the drylands. And so it's a bit of everything that we do to enhance the capacity, the resilience, uh, reduce vulnerability, enhance especially adaptation, and of course, we also uh, undertake activities that force on that uh, mitigation of uh, climate change. So as a program, the Green Green World offers a huge opportunity for, for resource mobilization, for adaptation as, uh, you know, uh, by the very nature of its creation, created uh, within the framework of uh, the, uh, the African Union Summit. Uh, uh, it was initiated actually by uh, President Olusu Bono Basanjo and uh, uh, with his friend um, uh, Abdullahi Ward. So they came together and they built a strong political response to uh, the challenges that was facing uh, the Sahel and the Sahara region uh, in those days. Although they, they actually, the challenges are still on, but I think they were less uh, shocking uh, before then. So 
with this strong political backing, with this strong political will, the Great Green War was universally accepted by both our member states and our development partners. So it stands up as a huge platform uh, to Ghana uh, support, unless all those who are concerned about uh, about uh, the certification of all throughout uh, all the continents today. Harris, hello. Hello, Harris. Please, um, you, I, I we know, I know you. I will know you are the institutional memory. You are giving us more than uh, what we ask for, maybe. <laughs> but uh, there's no problem with that. But uh, we are running out of time. Please, um, I think you've answered all the questions already. So, for you, yes, so, uh, uh, minute to summarize. Yes, Thank sorry. you. Yes. So, um, as far as resource uh, mobilization. For resilience is concerned. I think the Great Green Wall offers that platform, uh, that platform that uh, allows, that have been able to bring up uh, partners like uh, the World Bank, uh, the GEF, uh, the African Development Bank, and all the key um, uh, um, uh, institutions, um, both technical and financial partners, that, have, uh, that are, are now part of the implementation of this uh, initiative. And when you also look at the level of the policy, the Great Green Wall has put in place various policies that uh, enhances, that promotes uh, the, the um, uh, that gives, uh, highlights the issues of, of resilience, uh, highlights the vulnerabilities, but also the opportunities that exist uh, in this. Um, uh, uh, part of the continent. So it's, it's a huge, it's a, it's a very good platform as far as partnership is concerned. It's a very a perfect platform as far as regional, sub regional, and national policies are concerned. And when you look at in terms of uh, 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 results, you realize that for, uh, for the past uh, decade and a half, we have been engaged in various activities that have really produced some clear results. We are talking about uh, um, our the vision is to have uh, 100 million hectares of land restored by, 20, by the end of uh, the SDG by 2030, and also to have about 900 million hectares of land to to go on by 20, uh, 2063 in the Africa uh, agenda 2063. So we are. The, the program is doing, it's, it's really a platform that if all our partners come together, if all, every, um, uh, um, uh, our member state come together, there's a, there's a huge potential uh, for enhancing um, uh, uh, for resource mobilization. As you have known to come to the US, um, as of 2020, the Green Green World as a program has been able um, uh, to, uh, to mobilize more than uh, as we speak to about $23 billion um, from our development partners, uh, from uh, the EU, the ADB, and even as far as the, the Bank of America. And these funds are available for our partners, for our member states, to be able to, 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 um, uh, to support uh, resilience building in, uh, on the continent. Uh, so we uh, so there is a huge huge need. What we need here at this uh, moment is the ability for our member states to provide bankable projects. I will tell you we have a huge. As we said, we, the problem now is no longer the money at this level. The problem now is how do we absorb the absorb capacity of our member states and our partners to be able to spend some of these uh, funds that are on short uh, rotational periods, like some of them have three years, some of them have two years to go. So uh, the Great Green Wall as, as, an, as a resilient building platform has this strong um, attraction that can support programs and projects uh, on resilience on the continent, on adaptation, and of course on mitigation, especially focusing on the dry land. And so projects that want to use the Great Green Wall as a platform can uh, simply look at the vision, the mission, see how to, hand, to analyze, to see how to bring synergies and harmonization in, uh, in, in the kind of uh, project proposals that they have. And 
because they will be far more easier, especially to work with um, our national government, to work with our national agencies for the green world, to see how um, they can work together to, uh, um, uh, uh, to, to have the common programs, common projects that uh, will lead to um, uh, um, uh, what we call a multiple um, uh, achievements as far as resilience is concerned. And this can be in thank any you. field. Yes, thank you very much. Sorry, thank, you, thank, you, thank you, thank you, thank you. You have a very elaborate uh, presentation of uh, the great world the opportunities and terms uh, that lies with it uh, because uh, even the green recovery concept is going to learn a lot from the uh, great green world initiative in terms of uh, knowing the vulnerabilities, the resilience um, and adaptation issues. Um, so we are going to learn a lot from that, and uh, I think uh, we'll be sharing also the presentation of Evis with uh, everybody that is interested in having it. I think everybody will be like would like to really have your presentation um, for the details provided. So thank you very much. Um, we'll be moving on to uh, now to the economics of uh, the green recovery. Uh, how do we estimate that? Uh, what is needed? So how do we know how much we, we needed for green recovery in Africa? So nobody else but uh, Marco Alut will be talking to us on that, uh, on how uh, estimating the investment needs to build forward better in Africa through uh, natural capital. So um, Marco, uh, we are going to be asking your question, uh, one or two questions. The first one is uh, the calculation of finance needs is based on target detail in a strategy and action plan. Um, are these targets clear enough? Um, were costed and by African countries. Uh, I think this goes back, have they been costed outside the country or within Africa, within the African context? The second question is how can uh, your organization, the BAUFIN, uh, methodology be used to develop evidence-based uh, biodiversity finance plans and therefore can support nature-based uh, green recovery in Africa? Please, uh, Marco, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you, Julius. So I'm, I'm just going to give maybe a short introduction on, on what is Biofin actually. Um, so Biofin is a UNDP global program, uh, which is being implemented in 40 countries globally. And here the idea is to develop biodiversity finance plans, uh, which are evidence-based, evidence sorry. How do we do this? We do it through um, uh, three key uh, reports, uh, which the first one is really the is to understand what is the financial uh, framework uh, in, in, in the country. So we try to understand what are the policies and institutions which influence biodiversity finance. What are the mechanisms, the finance mechanisms that exist already in the country? Because we found that often when we arrive in a country, the government straight away wants to do something really innovative and, and, and great, but which is going to take a lot of time and might have much less impact, which uh, instead of looking what on what is already there and could be improved. And so this is a, a big part also of, of the various finance plan, finding what is already there and what could be improved as finance mechanisms. We also look into um, harmful subsidies. Uh, this was already mentioned a bit before, but again, here, great opportunities that, that, uh, that could deliver uh, finance for nature and green recovery um, and, and sustainable growth. Um, once we have this information, we can move to the second part, which uh, now we try to understand how much is spent for biodiversity for nature in the country. And here, most of the time, before biofin in the country, you would ask, what is the budget, uh, what is the expenditure for nature? The government would give you the budget area, which is not the case at all, because we uh, found out that, for example, in some countries, you would have the Ministry of Agriculture actually spending more for biodiversity than the Ministry of our Environment. You have the Ministry of Fishery, of Tourism. In some countries, you even have the Ministry of Defense, which is actually spending for biodiversity. So it's extremely important to understand who is spending for biodiversity and also start looking at the private sector and finance sector. So it's a huge momentum, as it was mentioned already before, the private sector has capital. They are just looking into where to invest. The finance sector is entering the, the race, the task force for natural financial disclosure. So there's a big momentum there to, to look into. First, also understand, are they already spending in the country for, for nature or not? Once you have the information, we move to the, um, the finance needs assessment. Here, the aim is to understand how much is needed to reach 
the, uh, the, the national targets. And this is related to the question you asked. I'm gonna go a bit deeper in, in this one, but just before those, all this information that I just mentioned allow to build a biodiversity finance plan, a national finance plan for nature, which will allow to implement the finance solution that are the, op the most optimal for the context, the one that are the most feasible with the most um, impact on biodiversity and on finance. And so to select those, we look into the, the finance solution that we, we already scanned in the countries that exist and we can improve, but also new ones. Uh, Biofin actually developed a catalog of 160 finance solutions that can be used for financing nature. Um, and so now we a bit uh, more into the needs. You were asking, how do we estimate the needs for the country? And often uh, what we do in Biofin is we take the National Biodiversity Strategy and Action Plan because we need something to cost. What, uh, what are the needs? How do you identify them? They are in the national strategy. The problem is, is that in the country, the National Strategy and Action Plan, uh, the NBSAP, is uh, often extremely unclear, so you cannot cost it. So an example would be in some countries we saw, for example, build a policy for sustainable forestry and implement it. What is it? How much does it cost? It's impossible to put a cost on that. So it's extremely important to have NBSAP that are extremely clear with clear targets and results, but also that are ambitious enough. Because if the ambitious enough, we're simply going to cost something which is going to be quite low. So it needs to be ambitious and clear. And then since we're here focusing on, on, on green recovery, it's extremely important to understand that during the, the COVID pandemic uh, in Africa, in particular, for example, tourism went down. Um, another possible risk is a, a risk related to ODAs, to the, to the official development assistance, which might be reduced because of external shocks. And so we found that nature depends too much from tourism and ODA. And so it's extremely important to have a diversified uh, portfolio of finance mechanisms. And this is where Biofin, the methodology in the, the catalog of 160 finance solutions help to, to have this, this diversification of mechanism, but also of actors using private sector, finance sector, uh, public sector, uh, because as it was mentioned also before, the public sector will not have enough to, to reach the, 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 the global targets and national targets. So you need to bring all the actors and there, there is a huge momentum. And finally, it's extremely important to look at the coins in both sides, we always say. It's great to always to, to look for uh, journey, generating new revenues for nature. And uh, the example is, for example, in Zambia, we worked um, um, to develop a framework for, for, for green bond, which was accepted by the Secure Exchange Commission. And now green bonds can be issued in Zambia. So this will allow to increase um, resources for nature. Uh, however, it's also extremely important to look at the other side of the coin, which is reduce the harmful uh, expenditures or improve the existing ones. And so here, the big example is harmful subsidies. While it's extremely hard to phase them out, uh, for example, agriculture or subsidies, it's possible to bring them. So give the same amount to the farmers, but instead of uh, paying for pesticides, you would pay for green criteria. And this, we found that once you dig into the information and you look into the details of how the subsidies are implemented, a lot of governments actually don't know how they're implemented, the, the, those incentives. In some countries, we found that, agro, uh, that subsidies on pesticides, when they were introduced, actually the yield didn't increase. So the main job of the subsidy didn't even work. So you could actually green this subsidy, for example, and this would redirect basically finance towards sustainable growth. And here you have a huge uh, potential and <clears throat> Uh, we calculated that per year, the, the public sector spent 121 billion globally for nature, while the OECD found that 500 billion is spent per year in harmful subsidies. So as long as we have this disequilibrium, we cannot have a sustainable growth anywhere. We will need to bring, um, to bring this balance in the other direction. <clears throat> so I hope I answered uh, your questions and I'm... Uh, Happy to answer more questions if needed. I prefer to be short because I don't know. I think there is another speaker. Thank you, thank you very much, Rocco. I think you've, you've done a wonderful uh, answer. You've given us a wonderful answer to, to, to the patients, um, especially with respect to the, the, the inclusiveness of the, of the process of making these estimations involving the countries. Um, I mean, putting, looking at what the country is putting in and whether it goes to nature or not, 
uh, bringing them in and bringing it in, into place uh, the private and public sector uh, is very important in the process. Uh, I think you've uh, really answered the question, uh, as usual related to because some participants were thinking about this all this issue of uh, just excluding the national actors and doing the estimations uh, for the countries. So you've really answered the education um, and then the issue of uh, maybe harmful sub subsidies because if the countries are actually involved, uh, they may have to eliminate issues related to ha harmful subsidies. Thank you very much, uh, Marcus. And we'll be moving to towards um, getting uh, Gozi, uh, Mr. Titilope Gozi on board. Um, please, uh, uh, Gozi, um, we'll be having uh, one or two patients actually related to um, the civil society organizations and uh, civil, uh, civil society. Uh, so what, the, what are the rules of the civil society organizations and communities in ensuring that funds obtained and disbursed are properly applied to meet the needs of the citizens in terms of impact and scale? That's the first yeah, question, uh, but I would like to ask a second question so that yeah, because it's related. Hello. Hello, hi. Can you hear me? Yeah, hi. Now, let me finish. Let me finish. Uh, so the last one is uh, uh, with the Green Recovery Council. What are the specific issues um, that financial institutions or funders must have in mind? To ensure funds meet its purpose and the demands of civil society. So all the two patients are interrelated. It's just for you to see uh, the, the good governance of uh, resources that get to the civil society. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you so, very much. I hope you, you can hear me very well. Yes, yes. All right. Hey, great. Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I think all protocols duly observed. I'm not sure whether there's any protocol <laughs> anyway. No, no, no anyway, protocol, yeah. yeah. Yeah, we all know the, it's, uh, the role of civil society is very, very clear for a lot of us who have been involved with civil society and where civil society have been engaging. I know the AFPP has uh, actually prioritized uh, engagement with civil society. But nonetheless, I think it's also very important for us to actually articulate uh, the specific uh, uh, role that civil society have been playing and could also play in terms of uh, green recovery in Africa, because I, we need to really be specific about where we're talking about now, because we are in Africa and uh, these are some of the things that a lot of us, uh, our countries, have uh, experienced the, the impacts of COVID itself. And when we are talking about recovery, of course, recovery, the issue of recovery stems from the fact that uh, we have COVID have impacted our countries and our people. And then how do we recover from it? And how do we make that recovery very green? And then civil society coming into the whole equation. For us as civil society, our role during the uh, pandemic was that uh, we, we worked with governments to actually respond to the impact of uh, COVID when it was on, very, when it was very much on, because I will tell you that COVID is still on, but of course it's not in a crisis form as it used to be. Right now, I think we've gone through a lot of waves, so it's, we've been able to understand how it's moving and what kind of intervention we should put on it. So, civil society worked with government to ensure that uh, um, response also get to the people. Again, civil society itself implemented some important actions like giving food away to those who are vulnerable, could not eat, especially during the lockdown, those who are, those who have access also to their daily uh, work and labor where they end their income. Yeah, we also ensured that uh, Non-pharmaceutical intervention also became very, very important for us to raise awareness. And also it was important for us to do a lot of monitoring and surveillance at the community level to ensure, to understand um, community um, spread 
of COVID and also give appropriate information to government officials so that they can do the needful at the right time. So getting out of COVID and then looking at climate change and climate impact and what should be our role. Of course, civil society have been engaged with climate change right from even before the Paris Agreement and up till now, I remember that a lot of us as civil society, we are in the forefront of advocating for just transition and ensuring that all uh, important aspects of the society are also recognized within the implementation of the Paris Agreement, like uh, the women's group, we are talking about the young people, we are also talking about um, uh, indigenous people, and then uh, into uh, um, um, every other vulnerable group that needed to be touched in terms of addressing the impacts of climate change. So for us as civil society, it has, it has always been in the forefront of what we do when we are dealing with the issue of climate change. So if you look at Paris Agreement, you see some of the wordings that are very, very important that are key to yeah, addressing the impacts of climate change on people. So. From there, we are recovering. We want to make this really green. Our role, first of all, is to understand the policy and explain the policy that government has, either at the local level or at the international level or at the regional level, because there are different policies that are coming up. And we need to explain these policies to the people because we're standing between the people and government and all the important institutions that matters. So for us, we need to raise a lot of awareness about what green recovery is, because I'll tell you, some people don't even understand it, what green recovery means. Of course, people have been discussing green, green, green finance, green this, green and everything, but then pulling in the issue of recovery into it. Now, people are wondering what is the difference? How does it, uh, how does it affect us? Is green recovery, uh, is a greening, green recovery so different from doing mitigation and ensuring that everywhere is green? Is it really about green economics? Is it really is easy? There's a lot of questions going on. So for us as civil society, we our role is to raise awareness, to let them understand the difference. Not only the difference, and to also let them know how they are also going to be part of that movement and how they are going to contribute to the movement. Because whether we are, whatever we are doing, whatever government is doing, we all have our role. We all have our role. We all have our role to play. So, so our role also is to support government to ensure that we have a just recovery. We must also ensure that just recovery means that human rights issues are brought into the space. What is the human right approach to it, to ensuring just to recovery? Because if we are saying we want to make everything, uh, we want to have a green thing, and then we have green jobs and people don't have that skills to engage green job, of course, there's going to be a lot of injustice. So we are looking at how do we reskill people? How do we make people get ready, of course, to be able to address the issue of green jobs, green transition, mitigation, and then long-term vision for mitigation. Because I know some countries already have what we call long-term mitigation strategy. And some others don't have some people are also in that, uh, in the middle of having it. So what does this mean for the all citizenship? The citizens must be carried along in all these, all these things. And then so that they'll be able to understand their role in terms of ensuring that whatever policy that is on the table, they also ensure that those policies are implemented. And for us as civil society, we need to hold government accountable. We need to hold institutions accountable. We need to hold regional uh, uh, organizations accountable. Accountable to what? If you said you are going to spend 100 million on a particular thing, have, we want to know how you have spent it. Even before spending it, we need to ensure that the right consultations are done. Are people consulted, those who are going to be affected, those who need the funds, are they being consulted to understand their needs so that when you are delivering some of this refinancing, they will also speak to the issues. It will speak to the needs of the people. So consultation is very, very important. And as civil society, we, can, we work with institutions to really ensure a robust consultation with the most relevant stakeholders. Very, very important because there are different stakeholders depending on the different kinds of issue we are, that is also coming up. So consultation is very, very key to us as civil society. We need to ensure that government and all the relevant uh, 
MDAs do the necessary consultations and with the right people. And then awareness is also very key because we also must understand what green resilience recovery means and then people can own the whole process itself. And then issue of uh, accountability is also very, very important for us as civil society. We need to ensure that uh, whatever financing that is coming into the system, whatever help, whatever solutions that we are putting on the table, and whatever reco uh, recovery actions that is on the table, we need to ask questions. In terms of when the implementation, before the implementation, when the implementation is on, and when the whole project may be or action has ended, we need to know what impact it has made. But when during the implementation, we are able to ask questions. When we see things go wrong, we're able to hold whoever is implementing accountable. That is where our real power is to hold them accountable. And it's, again, in terms of financing, we need to know where the money has gone into. And we also need to know who is getting the fund, who is uh, uh, having opportunity also to benefit from these funds. Are they the right people or the wrong people? And then we are, I think the second question now, yeah, and maybe you need to remind me a bit of the second question so I can respond to that also. Hello? Hello, can you hear me? Hello? Hello? Hello, 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 hello. Buzzy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, no, we can hear you. We you can know, hear talking, you. The second question, I just need to, uh, I, I want you to just repeat it so that I can just uh, put in a few The second question is on accountability. I think you have already elaborated on that. And that is fine. Um, uh, okay. So please, uh, you, we, we are already running out of time. And it's, uh, you have okay. elaborated on everything. A respect to stakeholders engage, engagement uh, through consultation and the, the facilitating role of the civil society organizations. That is very important. And uh, I think you really uh, try to uh, illuminate, uh, clarify all on the role of the civil society in uh, engagement in the recovery process, uh, how that can be, can, can be uh, handled. Uh, so uh, you work as, as a broker between government and the civil society, and uh, which is uh, very, very interesting. Thank you very much. Uh, and then we, 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 we follow up. And then uh, I think with respect to the comments uh, in the, the chat box, you also clarified on the comments on how best uh, we can uh, achieve green economy and mobilize uh, resources. Um, and how do we uh, uh, generate uh, strategic policy initiatives for for, for, for this continent at the continental level. I think it's all about uh, uh, being, being taking all stakeholders into, in, into consideration and then working together and being very, very accountable. Thank you very much. And um, we are running out of time. And I think uh, we, I don't know, we have to give ourselves another uh, five minutes um, to, 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 to brainstorm. Maybe the last question from somebody from the floor. Uh, that will be interesting. After that, we'll be going down to, to summarize other things. Thank you very much. So any quick question from somebody from the floor? If not, uh, we'll give a summary of the day and then uh, we'll try to see what next. I think it has been an a very, very exciting uh, webinar. We discussed the issues around uh, green recovery in Africa uh, from a diversion point of view. and. Uh, uh, so, um, as I said before, we have talked about the green opportunities, uh, the biodiversity finance, uh, meteorology, green infrastructure investments, uh, the green recovery um, or green economy plans, um, uh, now how that is done, and how synergies can be built. We have talked about uh, green energy transition, and uh, we've mentioned about that, the private sector engagement. I think we've talked about that with respect to uh, the example from uh, uh, from the bank, ECOWAS Bank. Uh, that, so that is very important. We need to add value to our product before we sell. That is a way of creating green jobs in Africa. Uh, we'll talk about uh, the allocation of funds to civil society organizations. How civil society organizations can get engaged, can be engaged in the green recovery process, and they're actually getting involved and they're helping a lot to do the monitoring of operations uh, uh, by governments and then reporting back uh, 
on, on, on issues to the, to the grassroots, explaining policies, government policies on all these issues. I mean, with respect to the green economy, they are also the ones to explain to the local people and take give feedback to government. So it's very important. Um, I think what we've not discussed today uh, is with respect to circular economy, uh, which is part of the green economy and uh, the issues linked to green bonds. Um, and uh, as well of uh, generating money for the green recovery process. So um, I would like to say that um, we will be talking about that in Africa, Africa offers great opportunities for green growth uh, post COVID recovery. And then that Africa, we must uh, go green and then we all must be climate resilient in Africa. I think those are some of the things that came up uh, and that uh, we need to boost green investment in energy, agricultural infrastructure. Those were the main uh, sectors that were mentioned. Uh, nobody actually, okay, there was also mention of uh, forest landscape restoration uh, as an option or an example of the great green war. Um, so uh, then uh, we, well, we did not actually talk about the abundant uh, solar, wind, hydro, geothermal energies, although we talk about energy, green energy uh, processes and the great transition to green, green energy, which is very important. And uh, I think that is what we'll be looking up to in the next uh, few years. Um, I think you know, the circular economy with respect to converting waste, recycling, and turning them into wealth in Africa is something we should be thinking about also. That is turning our plastics and uh, garbages into, uh, in, into usable products. Uh, I think there are also examples elsewhere, and they're all using organic fertilizers, and all that is part of what we may be thinking about uh, the circular economy. And based on that, uh, some of these things we may be tapping uh, some of some of the things that we've not discussed today, especially with respect to secular economy um, and uh, green bonds. Maybe some the subject of our next um, uh, web, uh, web webinars series. So um, we'll be coming back to you uh, to this great team uh, very soon uh, to talk more about uh, uh, the next uh, topic. Uh, for, for, for this year, within this year, so it's not going to be next year, we're going to come back and then we'll have more discussions on this. Thank you very much. And uh, we have to thank everybody. Uh, I don't know where we should end here or somebody has a quick message to can stop me. And if somebody has something very quick to say, you say that. If not, I will want to thank everybody, the guest, the guest speaker, the imminent guest speaker, the keynote speakers, the panelists. The interpreters, I'm talking very fast, but I think they're getting some of the issues. The IT, the organizers, the participants, and my humble self, the moderator, for participating in this important webinar series. Um, and to that, I say nice, day to, nice evening to everyone, and uh, I will say bye bye. Uh,